The 1980s, we've already tracked Fred and Ted and their association with Colonel Joseph Alon in the 1970s, and now we're getting into the 1980s, and the 1980s were a very dynamic time. We still didn't have the internet, not readily access to the internet. There was no digitized files. Access to information is very slim. Good luck trying to track down an assassin overseas using paper files and trying to make these connections. Today, again, Fred Burton, Ted Andre, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Jason. Thanks for having us, Jason. Now, Fred, I'm going to start off with you because in the 1980s, you just, did, is that when you first started your Fed career? Yeah, it was. And uh, I had started in 1981 and uh, it was just a different era. You know, it's the era of the revolver which uh, I know you probably remember, Jason and, and Ted, and um, that's what we were issued. Uh, the pistols didn't come around to the 90s, and uh, we literally had no computer in our office when I first started, and everything was in hard paper files, uh, three-by-five index cards, and literally, you would be scrolling through a file folder of an assassination, for example, uh, or a hostage taking and come across something that doesn't belong there at all. You know, it's just been misfiled. And it was very much teletype, cable driven, uh, 302, report of investigation files, memorandums that uh, for the most part were poorly written. And you would even find evidence stuck in files, near not, not making its way into the evidence locker. A street agent, you know, it, the last thing they want to do is deal with paperwork. They think, hey, you know, and especially back in the 80s, the FBI was notorious for this up until the 2000s where they would have people typing their reports for them. But back then, it's even worse because you're like, hey, you know what? We have so much going on, typing up a report, getting it into the file. And then if somebody requests it, you have to get a copy of that. And you got to either, like you said, put it in a teletype. And it wasn't like the days of, hey, we're going to fax this over. We're going to send this by email. We're talking snail mail. So just that, if you're requesting, let's say we're tracking a suspect. We kind of have an idea where he's at. He goes to Europe. He goes from Europe to here, the hair to there and everywhere. That's different mailing systems. And it takes months and years. But you just get into law enforcement. You're just learning how to be a federal agent. Taking that step from the street cop into the federal agent world, tell us about that first couple of years, because this will put the basis of later on how long it takes you to actually start tracking down and working with authorities and start putting this story together. Well, Jason, uh, at that time, you know, you kind of feel that you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof, right? Like, like most of us were, uh, but uh, in, in many ways, I, I was greatly unprepared to, to do the job that was given to me in, in many ways. Uh, you know, we've chatted a, a lot about this, you know, looking back on your career, that in many ways, I think I was well in over my head. Uh, half the time, I, I truly did not know what I was doing. I was just trying to do the best I could, uh, utilizing a little bit of common sense at times. But I think the lack of technology really hurt us as you look back as how far we've come today. No internet, no Google. We're working with Polaroid cameras. We're literally using measuring tapes for crime scenes. Um, we're collecting and bagging our own evidence to be sent back and hopeful that ATF or the FBI lab would take a look at something that you might have collected. So. It was just a different world and a different time. It, it certainly wasn't what people's perceptions are of CSI. CS <laughs> out of CSI really is wasn't even created back then. Back then it was like you know you'd have some blood, you'd have some fingerprints. But what we're talking about today about today about cross transference of of stuff from here and there, like the crime scene, Colonel Joseph Alon's crime scene. Now Ted, at this same time, you're boom, you're getting into the eighties. 
where was your dad at? What was your what was your experience of the 80s and about everything that was going on in the back of your mind about everything? Well, for me, as a, as a kid in the entertainment business trying to learn the ropes, I was pretty well focused on that. And I knew I knew enough to know not to ask dad too much about what he did from all the years of that experience. However, details would filter through from time to time. And this kind of relates to the one story I shared when he would he would come and visit me from time to time. Now, mind you, this is a little later on, like late 80s. And uh, he came to visit and we went to the restaurant that we like to go to. And uh, I took a brief restroom break. And this was a Benihana's with about 12 people around the table. And when I came back, no more than two and a half, three minutes, he knew everyone's first and last name, where they lived, what they did for a living, and was speaking fluent Japanese with the waitress. And it was things like this that sort of opened the door into there's a, a whole side of him that I'm gradually learning, but can't really be discussed. And I learned later on the reasons for that, but it, it, be, it began to get a little more interesting at that point. But being so focused on entertainment, I kind of had, I was split between the two. And it was really tricky to, to gain more details, but each visit I would try to ask questions that could be answered and learn a little bit more about that background. But still, he was traveling a lot and, and basically gathering intel even at that point, but I think on a different in a different capacity than when been earlier in the 70s in the Elan period. And you know, you're as you're growing up a teenager into your young adult life, everybody does it. They start picking and they start putting two and two together. When did your dad actually come out and say, hey, look, I'm in the uh, Intel community, the IC. I can't really tell you what's going on, but I'm doing some stuff. You know, what was did he what were the kind of the stories that he told you that weren't classified or anything? And it was just kind of like, hey, you know what? I did this, I did that. Well, he did speak about the Sante operation and he spoke about rescuing the POWs and he described what an airstrike was like. And this, this, <laughs> this resulted uh, from a discussion about a lot of the music I listened to. Like, so you take Slayer and Metallica and these sorts of really aggressive bands. And at one point we're driving in the car and he said, that reminds me of a chopper raid in Vietnam. And I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. Tell me that story. And he would talk about the airstrikes that they would typically come in before dawn and they would uh, basically take care of business. And he said in his, in his sort of constant means of understatement, those that were left were relatively angry. And so we had to go in and address them face to face because there was so much smoke and that sort of thing that you really couldn't conduct the operation the way that you'd started. So it kind of shed some details into this, but he curiously didn't really discuss this as much with uh, with the rest of the family, just strictly on our one-to-one -one conversation. So he shared those details. And at one point in, in Germany, I recall I found a catalog. In this catalog, I was playing hide and seek with my sister as kids are, you know, tend to do at that age. And I open up this catalog and in the catalog, there's a parabolic reflector and it, you could aim this thing at a distance down the street and hear a conversation. There was a briefcase and the handle would deploy a nine millimeter slug. And there was a, uh, an umbrella that had, I forget how many thousand volts that it would deploy if someone got too close. And I, as I was reading this, it kind of reminded me of what I'd seen in the bond films and I hastily closed it, put it back under the bed and didn't say a word about it. So uh, that kind of unintentionally and, and sort of led to a discovery of some of what was involved in that, but not not too many details. I never asked him about that catalog, by the way. <laughs> well, you know, Ted, now, Ted, you got Ted, you got to think about the way technology had changed from the 70s to the 80s to the 60s. And you're talking about the parabolic mics. And you're talking about all these different assassination gadgets. But Fred, you're getting into the counterterrorism business. You're not just getting in to become a special agent doing, you know, 18 USC crimes, you know, just prop, you know, violent crimes or anything else, but you're getting into that counterterrorism. You went through your basic training, but then you get into this world of learning how to use this technology. Let's talk about your basis and your in your background in that. Yeah, it was really kind of interesting, you know, be careful what you wish for, right, in this world. Uh, you know, I went from street cop to uh, counterterrorism agent, and I literally, once I graduated from basic agent training, Jason and Ted, I, I went right away to our, what I learned to be our three-person counterterrorism branch. At that time, we were just a branch. And, uh, of course, my my uh, thought process was that I would be walking into this office that looked like something right out of uh, either Man from Uncle or, uh, and it turned out to be more of something right out of Get Smart, where uh, we have uh, just a small little hole in the wall, no windows behind a big blue door. 
uh, with an S and G hyperlock, and we kind of stepped in our own little world, and and there was just the three of us. And my uh, fellow agent who had uh, gone through basic agent training with me had been a DEA agent for many years, and before that a New York State trooper. And he was much more seasoned than me. And um, he had worked, uh, you know, the, the Chinese organized crime and, and some of the drug traffickers from <clears throat> Latin America in those days. So he was given Latin America and Central America. And our boss at the time uh, assigned the, the, the sandbox, as he called it, the, the Middle East to me. And uh, which also included every group that was operating around the world out of the Middle East. So you know, the likes of the Black September organization and Abu Nidal. And, you know, the first couple of days, Jason, and I told Ted this story, you know, he, he laid on my desk uh, the, the uh, hostage file of Bill Buckley, uh, the uh, Beirut embassy bombings, Beirut 1 and Beirut 2, uh, the U.S. embassy bombing in Kuwait, and then uh, our papal files on the Black September organization. And he said, if you if you want to learn how terrorist groups operate, get smart and read this file. So uh, the the learning curve was very steep, and you know, heck, I I had been a cop, right? You know what I mean. I I had never seen a classified document. I did not know what the difference between a top secret document and a law enforcement sensitive document. You know, at, at best, that's all I'd ever seen before I'd taken this job. So. You know, you step into a different world in those days. It was just very much uh, paper driven and, and trying to do the best you can. And then actually going out when an explosion happens somewhere or a hijacking or an attack, sometimes by yourself, most of the time, to figure out what happened. So as best as I can explain it, which I tried to do with my first book, Ghost, is you were pretty much like a patrol officer taking an initial report. You were just doing that around the globe. So that's what I would tell myself when I was put in these positions. It's, I would try to ground myself with that kind of mindset, recognizing that at times the stakes were a little bit different. Instead of uh, uh, investigating a, um, a burglary in Montgomery County, Maryland, I was investigating a shooting in Madrid, Spain. I'm glad, you know, putting that into context like that, like, hey, you know what? You're going to gather your intel, you're going to put it in a report, and then other people are going to use that report. Just the facts, none of this elaboration. I like that. I like putting it into that perspective because just as one person, when you hit the ground, you have to do your liaison, you got to pull information from everybody and compile it. And that is one of the reasons that you became such an expert in the CT field, counterterrorism field. Plus all the books and all the research and everything else that go along with your, your past decades of 40 years of experience. Well, I, you're very kind to say that. I, I uh, beg to differ. I, I don't think there's many, I don't think I'm an expert in, in pretty much of anything, Jason. Uh, but, Let's just uh, say you have a, a heck of a knowledge base based on your years of experience. How does that sound? That's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, you're my you're my go-to when it comes to the with the uh, the CT field and especially Beirut and everything in the Middle East like that. Now, Ted, you're you're kind of in and out. You're doing the rock thing. You're like, hey, what's up? How was your dad? What was he doing in the '80s? I mean, because now your dad has twenty something years of experience. Plus, he's in the '80s. He's probably at a different level in the government. Things are going on, and you're you're sitting back here like, hmm. Have you ever? Did you ever think about jumping into the field? Well, at one point, he uh, after a, one of the discussions we had, I can't recall the details, but he said, "I think you'd be really good in my line of work," and I took that as a compliment, even not knowing the degree of which uh, that work would would involve uh, that skill set, if you will. And then I asked him point blank, "So tell me exactly what it is you do," and he's like, "Well, maybe a little later, son." So. He didn't share too, too, too terribly much, but I know he was for a while the head of the NMIA for, for many years and uh, was involved. I think he worked with a company that did a lot of aerospace uh, technology. iTech, I believe, was one of them as well. So he did a lot of consulting and 
and things that tangentially related to that line of work, but again, didn't really share too many details. I actually learned more later on when he shared the details, for example, about Colonel Alon and looking into that matter. And that kind of opened the Pandora's box of, wow. So the little clues that I got earlier on gradually started to come together and make sense based on that actually to a degree being the beginning of peeling back the onion. So in today I would have a much different line of questioning and conversation with him based on everything that thankfully I've learned from Fred and, and our discussions like this. So um, um, sharing clues as they come to mind, you know, the things about him immediately being able to relate to people. That was one thing that I always found key. It didn't matter where we were, what we were doing, always building a rapport almost instantaneously and had a pretty much photographic memory for detail. And I remember him saying at one point that, and this was verbatim, uh, if you have multiple targets in a day, you can't keep a list and you have to commit these things to memory. So there were things like that where I'm thinking, okay, so it's not only, you know, for myself, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, Jason and Fred, how you guys do this. I have a to-do list every day. I have things I have to tick off the list and get to. And in this line of work, once you once you leave and, and, and are doing your, your thing, you can't have these pieces of paper on you for obvious reasons. So that kind of thing. And the more I thought about it and the more I read entertainment related period, uh, material that goes into that, the more questions came to mind, which then kind of, again, opened up this Pandora's box. So I, I probably a, a big, long paragraph there of not saying too much, but it really prompts the uh, the instincts right now. Like I would have, a, I would just love to chat and, and get more detail as to what was going on at that point, because keep in mind, this is also the time frame which, and I think I shared this story and, and, and I'll kind of give a, a little a little hint here again, in the entertainment business, there was a contract that wasn't adhered to. And when the contract wasn't honored, and I knew enough to know that that's the thing that's supposed to be done based on what you sign, I shared the details of this individual and this group where they were located and what they were doing. And all of a sudden, everything is fixed. So situations like that would let me know that whatever this line of work was, it, it was pretty high level and he was very capable of assistance when needed in situations like that. But again, in a diplomatic, but very, very firm manner. So these are the types of things that led to my uh, level of inquisition or, or curiosity. Now, when I speak with Fred and, and people like you with this background is trying to really get more context into kind of connecting these dots and understanding the full context of all of this. Now with your dad, obviously after the Colonel was assassinated in the 1980s, did your dad talk about anything Did it, did his name ever come up? The name only, and this is interesting too, I recall it from Virginia, from, from back in the day when we were younger, but later on, no, there was no mention of it. And it, perhaps because it was an ongoing investigation, they were trying to get the details to it. This would maybe tie in with why that, that was such a big uh, request for him, but no, there was no mention of it. Now, Ted, I mean, Fred, now later on in the 1980s, you can start working this stuff. You can start pulling away that onion peel, you can start saying, Hey, you know what? I want to know what's going on now. You got some years on a job. It's not 1981 anymore. You're like, Hey, look, I've been all over the country. I've been all over the world pulling together resources on counterterrorism investigations. I want to take a look at this. When did you really first, did you start pulling it back in the 1980s looking into it? I, I did. And, uh, I, f we first had a hard paper file of the case in our, um, file cabinets, and it was by year. Uh, so I went to uh, 1973, and I started just scrolling through the different attacks. And there were many, many attacks overseas. And there was a very small um, file of the Elan case, and it contained photocopies of the Washington Post and the Washington Star stories. The, the Star was the evening newspaper in the D.C. area during that time period. And then it had um, a couple teletypes that somebody from the State Department had sent out concerning the killing. And um, I said, this is just very odd. And so I, the first thing I did was playing analyst just start, started to draw information in. So I actually called uh, the Montgomery County Police that I had come from and spoke to their, at that time, the cold case division and uh, they had the original file, the original police incident file. So I remember driving up to Rockville, Maryland and getting a copy of that. 
and that literally, you know, started that uh, research for me into what happened. So I secured the the first local police file, and I had that in the file drawer. But I, I, I literally, Jason had no crime scene pictures. I had no pictures of Colonel Alon other than what was available on um, in the newspaper at the time. Uh, there was no traffic from the Israeli government whatsoever in the files. Um, there was no reports of interviews surrounding any of this. And, and so I think, uh, you know, and I, I've thought through this on many, many nights as to why I did not try to do more. Um, I remember sitting down and, and physically typing a cable in those days on uh, our IBM Selectric and sending it to the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv requesting information surrounding this from the, the government of Israel, which is something we would typically do. And uh, of course, that cable went uh, unanswered for weeks. And then I sent a tickler back, you know, a, you know, per my earlier request, is there anything that uh, has surfaced here, which I'm sure didn't make the embassy happy, right? Because somebody had to go and look for that. And, and in essence, I remember the response back was that uh, the Israelis are saying they have no information on file uh, connected to this case. And I, you know, during that time period, you know, this is now probably circa 1986, 87. We were so overwhelmed with current cases that cold cases like the murder of Colonel Alon were literally what you did when you had downtime, if you had any. And so um, that is one of the biggest regrets I have in not only this story, Jason and Ted, was when I first started looking at this, I could have tried to find people like Ted's dad. There was a lot of people that, that were alive that knew Colonel Alon, that worked with him at the embassy. And by the time I got around to doing something on this aggressively, a lot of these folks had passed away. And so um, with them, you know, literally uh, memories are buried. And you have nothing to go on. Now, Fred, that brings something to mind in, in listening to your, your, your passage there. Dad did spend a lot of time in Israel at this point. It was back and forth frequently, and we had a lot of uh, Israeli friends coming over on a regular basis. So I do recall that that was a big part of the travels. Yeah, that's, so. that's fascinating. And, you know, Jason uh, and, and Ted and I have talked about this for ad nauseum, uh, you know, the relationship between these two men, Ted's father and Colonel Alon, I just wish I knew the scope. I just wish I could have been a fly on the wall. Uh, we know they were helping each other in some capacity, uh, official, you know, liaison capacity, back and forth. Uh, but the nature of their friendship is something that I really would like to have uh, explored more too, because, you know, Ted. Um, who is pretty close to being an Indiana Jones in, in my mind. He's data mined out of his father's diaries, you know, uh, just <clears throat> telephone numbers. And even Colonel Alon's wife's name is in one of uh, the diaries. Yeah. And so, you know, in the official capacity business, that's something that just ne would not necessarily be there, right? So there's a personal relationship between these two, these two warriors that uh, I just – did not know about at the time that I'm officially looking into this case. What are those diaries like? I'd like to well, see some of that too. It's, it's in a way kind of, a, it's reminiscent of what we would call a to-do list. And these are notes in, in many cases of meetings that were happening with dates associated with these. And the interesting part about this is from what I'm piecing together with Fred's help and of course, uh, Ed Golian is that, certain parts of these, and again, as much as it's in that analog fashion, are coded. There's a lot of times six digit numerical codes associated with these things. So it's not necessarily a phone number, but it certainly relates to something. And there are key terms, key names, like we said, Colonel Alon's name is in there, his wife's in there, along with some key uh, officers and operatives involved in the intel community. And there's dates associated and years associated with it and, and operations associated with it. And strategic moves with regards to, for example, debriefings, 
uh, bringing people on board, the the nature of the the mindset of the people that come on board, whether they fit with the team or not. So it's very interesting details, but because there's not necessarily a an overall operation name because so much of this was classified. We're having to put it together based on some of the codes and the timeframes. So it's clues, good clues, but nonetheless still clues that were like breadcrumbs that we're putting together, which makes this whole process very interesting. And we're always learning something new. In fact, we can look at the same page we've looked at before and see something we didn't notice last time around. In fact, that happened recently with Fred and I. So we'll continue to data mine these things uh, in the analog sense and, and try to continue to to build a framework around all of this. This special episode brought to you by Big Tech's Ordinance, bigtechsordinance.com. What I love about Big Tech's Ordinance is they have live inventory, meaning if I want a product and I look on their website and it says it's there, it's there. And most likely, if I order it that day, it will ship that day. If you're looking for parts for a Glock, you want to upgrade your Glock, you want to build a Glock, head over there. You want to upgrade a an AR-15, go there. You want to buy a brand new AR-15 top of the line, go there. Big Tech's ordinance, incredible inventory, anything from, like I said, Glock, the Trijicon, the Surefire. And the inventory is live. If it says out of stock, it's out of stock. But guess what? If it's in stock, it's there and you could order it. Their customer service is beyond reproach. I've called them. I need anything. They're on it. So check out bigtechsordinance.com. Now, I'm fascinated by that stuff. I That's the investigator in me. That's the special agent in me of like looking at data and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And, and now you have these diaries and it's like, wow, when did you like, did you after your dad passed? Is that when you found out about the diaries or did you? He yes, said, hey, look, take a look at this. Well, these, based on his uh, request, of course, to look into the matter, one of the things that kind of an instinct that struck me is let me look for maybe newspaper articles that were cut out. Let me look through the uh, any kind of records that were kept because he kept telling me that he would keep, he did mention it growing up, he keeps a journal, he keeps a record, and he got me used to assessing goals, for example, like just these things you teach a kid, you know, have a, a, a game plan, have an operation plan, I used to call it. So it struck me as natural that he would have these sorts of things. But when I go through them now, it's with a totally different mindset, especially after speaking to Fred. So prior to meeting with Fred, it's very much to, to use the Indiana Jones analogy. It's like trying to look at hieroglyphics to a degree, because as much as it's not Egyptian, it's certainly the type of thing that I wouldn't necessarily have the frame of context for. But now after discussing this with Fred and Ed and then going back and looking for clues relating to the questions that come about from looking into this, then peels back that onion even further. And I'm sure there'll be more of that in, in the coming weeks as well, because I'm, I'm going through some more of that as we speak. How many, uh, how many journals are there? Well, there's at least four. And, and the thing about these, though, is they're not necessarily always in order. For example, there may be notes relating to a previous operation that will then pop up later based on, uh, to quote the Big Lebowski, new shit has come to light. That's a quote I love. Um, so trying to put myself into his mindset, and it may be the type of thing, too, where you have to hastily write something down. So it may not be necessarily in paper, if that makes sense, in an analog fashion. So there's a degree of having enough context in there to then look for the clues, and with those clues, in turn, build more context and shed more light. But it's it's an ongoing process that's just amazing to do, actually. And again, big now, thanks Fred. to Fred and, and having these discussions to sort of get the juices flowing, if you will. Well, that's the thing. I can imagine, Fred, your adrenaline went finding out about these journals. And, you know, this case is your life. Seriously. I mean, in 1973, it's always been there. It's still there. And, and we're talking 49 years because I'll be 49 tomorrow. So I know how, I know the age now. So the thing is, it's getting these journals. It was like like peeling open like, oh, my gosh, it's like you're finding new information and, and new back of this story. Let's. Let's talk about your first experience looking at the journals or diaries. Well, uh, to me, it, it's it's much like uh, uh, back to the Indiana Jones analogy is is finding something that you haven't seen before related to something that you've stared at forever, right? Or it's been a part of. And <clears throat> you know what I mean from an investigative perspective, Jason, when you have a new lead pop in that 
all of a sudden helps you try to make sense of things. I mean, look, we know Joe Alon was murdered. Uh, I know who did it, uh, but there's still missing pieces of the puzzle surrounding the case that um, literally make little sense to me still today. And so when Ted reached out to me with this, it was like, wow, well, let's try to connect those dots. You know, how did your dad know Colonel Alon? And let's, let's bracket around the day of the murder. Let's start looking at the 72 hours before and the 72 hours after and, and, you know, kind of walk back the cat from there in each direction and, and try to make sense as to how your dad was helping Colonel Alon and the government of Israel during this time mm -hmm. period which was a pivotal moment in, in great power competition. Uh, you, you know, you have um, in 1973, I mean, Israel has not been the, the state uh, that, for that long. And, and Joe was um, certainly, uh, you know, part of the Holocaust. The Holocaust was very fresh in everybody's mind in 1973. And mm -hmm. Joe's family had been wiped out by the nazis and and you know my dad had been in the military police um in world war ii and had been at nuremberg and so you know this is the kind of thing that as you look at this from a historical perspective is really a fascinating time period in, in global history not not to mention the 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 you know the combined diplomatic efforts between israel and the united states so uh, and these two men are right in the weeds here and uh, trying to help each other. And so, uh, you know, you have uh, just an intriguing time period with so many things happening in the world. But at the end of the day, you've got a man that was murdered that um, was forgotten by our government in some manner and also the Israeli government. Uh, and yet you had people like Ted's dad that, that never forgot. And I think that's what soldiers do, right? You, you never forget your comrades, your buddies, your friends, those that have been lost. And, you know, Joe was uh, uh, killed in, the, in a silent war that was underway. If you think about context, World War II, when you brought up the Holocaust, I didn't even, I, I, like my time, space analogy is a little bit off but think about it this way 1973 was like our, the 1980s to us it seems like it was yesterday to me sometimes but in 1973 world war ii was like the 1980s you know it was right it was right there in 1990s it was right. right there it wasn't like it was like 100 years before it was like right there so there's a lot going on one thing i i think about as we've had these discussions and as i learn more about this close relationship between ted's dad and Colonel Joseph Alon is what if they were together that night? What if they were together that night? And what if that, you know, what if that assassin was there and took shots at both of them? You wonder about things like that. And I'm sure that's crossed your, both of your minds. Well, one of the things that, that dad shared with me when he told me about the story was, and I'm trying to get the context as to the exact time frame, And I've, I've talked about this with Fred is the thing that clued him in that something went wrong before he read the news story was that Joe didn't show up. They were supposed to meet and Joe never showed up. And that's what led him to think that something must have happened. And the interesting part, just from an investigative perspective, Jason, is Joe really never intended to go to this going away party, but he was kind of a late addition. So was he slated to meet with Ted's dad after exactly. the party? Uh, I don't know. And, and that's, you know, those are the kinds of details that uh, literally I lie at wake at night thinking about and trying to put that piece of the puzzle together. But we know for a fact that uh, Devorah, Joe's wife, uh, portrayed these series of pre-operational indicators before the, the murder. We had at least three of them, you know, beginning with... Um, a stranger in broad daylight that's standing outside her kitchen window. And, you know, look, this is a neighborhood that this doesn't happen, right? Really, it just doesn't happen. And everyone knows everybody, right? And mm -hmm. everybody knows everybody. And it's the 1970s. And 
uh, this is not a high trafficked kind of area. You, you, you have to hunt for this house. It's off the beaten path. And then there's this ruse call that's placed, which was quite common in those days by nation state intelligence services and terrorist groups to try to locate people and law enforcement, as you and I know, you know, you place a ruse call is, is Joe there. And then the third thing was this uh, Washington gas light meter reader that shows up and heads into the basement and the meters were read on the outside. What was he doing in the basement? You know, one of the theories was perhaps he showed up that day and he was hoping that Joe would answer the door and he would just pull out a pistol or a revolver and shoot him. But he didn't. Uh, the missus answered the door. And so you have this tempo of events that takes place. You have... Ted's dad scheduled to meet with Joe and then Joe's killed. And then the family is literally whisked out of the country the next day. And that's how quick all this happened. I think about technology nowadays and, you know, there, everybody has a ring camera. Everybody knows what's going on in the neighborhoods, but, and it's easy to do surveillance now. Because now you can just drop a car with a camera in it. I mean, we used to do that back in the, in the early 2000s, is drop a car with a bunch of cameras in it, and you could watch a place. You could put a pole cam up. But back then, there there was probably so many pre-threat indicators that nobody noticed. You know, there's probably surveillance package on the colonel that he might not have picked up. They might have been that good. I mean, obviously, they were that good because, this, like you said, this assassination – in order for them to just, they must have been lying in wait for a while. They must have known his pattern of life. They must have known so much about him that you don't, you don't just go out and shoot someone. It's not like, you know, this isn't like the movies where, hey, you just show up, the guy's going to get out of his car. It's not that easy to just do it. You have to be watching. You have to do surveillance. You have to get that pattern. So you're not in return killed. Because they are going against an Israeli operative and they have to assume that he's armed. So they have to assume that they're going to get him at a state of surprise and it ambush him. So there had to be so much about this assassination. Without a doubt. And I've looked at a lot of cases just like this that have occurred around the globe for years. There is no doubt in my mind there was heavy pre-operational surveillance conducted and Let's not lose sight of the victim here, right? This is a hero of the state of Israel who had been part of the original creation of the Israeli Air Force. <clears throat> Ted's dad is in the Air Force. This man was uh, the assistant military attache at the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. That in 1973 is one of the premier diplomatic posts in the world for the state of Israel. That is the plum job to get, right? And he's there. And his job <laughs> is to work with the Pentagon and, and people like Ted's dad to keep the state of Israel alive. And now we were dependent upon Israel too, as we all know, the geopolitics of the region. Uh, this is one of our allies during this time period because of the great power competition. So this was a big deal. And... Um, if this case happened today, you would have probably had no short of uh, 150 FBI agents on the scene. Uh, you would have rolling uh, Fox and CNN and, and NPR there for the next week. But on the flip side, if this happened today, I'm reasonably optimistic that the FBI would have captured the individual that pulled the trigger. And the CIA would be involved in hunting down those overseas that uh, were responsible for putting this together. It, it to me, it's like assassinated crickets. Yeah. There's nothing until, you know, you get into it. Now, when you first started getting into it, what was it? Were you, did you, there, there was a cold case. Do you have to reopen it? How do you do that? Yeah, our uh, case filing system at the time, we actually did not even have a case number assigned to this at the time. It was just stuck in the 1973 kind of era where we had all kinds of attacks around the globe. We had a couple of our diplomats killed in Beirut. 
We had uh, a horrific Black September attack in Khartoum where our U.S. ambassador was murdered. Uh, so Black September was out and about and heavily operating in the, in the 72, 73 timeframe. So I opened up what we called a CTO-1 case, a counterterrorism-01 case, which was an assassination. The next two digits were the, the month and year, 07-73. Uh, uh, and then, uh, if memory serves me right, 100 was the United States. And then, then I digitized whatever. Uh, we, you literally had a uh, a uh, file folder that you would just take a red pen and cross off and say, okay, this was the 26th assassination case you've opened <clears throat> or the 27th. And I don't remember the last four digits of the case number off the top of my head, but uh, so I opened up a case file. I, you know, formally assigned myself as the case agent and um, kind of went from there and just started piecing together what I could and, and collecting information. Did you have management support behind you? I did. I, my boss uh, at the time was wonderful, Steve Gleason. He was probably about as good of a boss you possibly could have had in this space. I, I talk about him a lot in Ghost. Um, you know, he had done uh, some of the more uh, sensitive government investigations for years before he took me under his wing. He had done some of the original hostage debriefings and and many of the terrorist attack investigations overseas, pretty much by himself. Uh, he subsequently uh, designed the current Rewards for Justice program, the, the $20 million for bin Laden. Uh, he actually wrote that original poster out on a napkin, uh, which he showed me when we had that program assigned to us uh, as well. Uh, he was very supportive, but he also uh, was very tough and said, you know, look, like like bosses were in that time period, you know, we have real world hijackings, we have real world killings, we have, you know, for every attack that you see, as you know, Jason, there's 10 threats that sometime resulted in us having to go out and look into the threats, just not the attack. So... The time spent on this case um, was minimal, to be honest, uh, which is, again is something that uh, I've apologized to the Elan family for. Uh, I, I could have done a better job uh, and I should have done a better job, but I didn't. But um, through the good graces of the likes of you for keeping this story alive and, and men like Ted, you know, following his father's wishes and trying to do the right thing, uh, the story is not over. We're, we're, we're still right there. We're still working this case, right? Exactly. You know, one thing about it is memories, history. If you forget someone's name and their, their name isn't said anymore, then they're forgotten in history, but you've kept that name going. Both of you have, and so many others and hindsight in our careers, Fred, we know that as I, I, I come to the last year of my my career after 20 something years is like you wish you could go back and do things differently. You always do. And I listen, Fred, with the resources you had, I don't fault you. I don't think anybody could fault you. And I think keeping this alive and keep talking about it and keeping the colonel's memory alive and now keeping Ted's dad's memory alive because Ted's dad lived in the shadows for so long. And keeping his memory alive. And now the public will know about the other heroes that have been in the shadows. And maybe they'll know what's going on behind the scenes. That no case is ever really closed. It may go cold. It may get quote unquote solved. But some of them always go on. And this is one of them. We got into a little bit of the, the 1980s this time. We learned a lot more about Ted's background especially with his dad's journals. I didn't realize about the diaries and journals. I want to get into more of that. Fred, we also got into the beginning of your Fed career, getting into the counterterrorism field. The next episode what I'd love to do is get into more of the investigative techniques, more into the story, dive more into everything and how these culprits came to justice, or at least some of them. 
But, you know, just to recap, one thing that just drives me crazy is that assassinated and crickets. Like you said, if this happened today, there'd be 150 agents there, the intel community, and 50 different news stations. Ted, Fred, one of you, uh, any any recap or anything you want to talk about before we end this episode? Well, I'm just uh, uh, grateful for, uh, again, both Fred and Jason, just the fact that we have these discussions. And I think even in the course of these discussions, they bring up more points that we may individually take for granted because they're part of our own individual stories. But when we bring them into the room, so to speak, it leads in another direction and maybe some more dots being connected, as we like to say. So I just think that this ongoing discourse is terrific. I, I'm very, very grateful to uh, both of you and, and to the fact that the story is still, we're still learning more. We're still on the hunt, as Fred likes to say. Listen, as we go into this, uh, Fred, I'll let you go in a minute. But everybody, as we go into the story, we might backtrack to the 70s. We might go here and there because I want to know more and I want to continue this conversation. Fred, what do you got for us? Well, first, uh, I can't thank you enough, Jason, for helping us uh, tell this story. Uh, you know, that's half half the issue at times, getting the word out there. Uh, you never know who else you're going to reach or touch with this. Uh, I'm extraordinarily grateful for Ted's efforts and not only keeping his father's memory alive, it would have been so easy to forget about this and, and move on. Everybody's busy in, in life in this world, but he hasn't. He wants to make sure that he keeps his father's memory alive too and to do the right thing. And at the end of the day, that's that's always been one of my guiding principles, uh, regardless of how difficult or tough it was at times. Just, um, And I really am grateful for that. So thank you both. One thing I do want to say is if you're enjoying this series with Fred and Ted, pick up the book Chasing Shadows, a special agent's lifelong hunt to bring a Cold War assassin to justice. It's available everywhere books are sold. It's an excellent book. I've read it myself. You know, I have a million books. I've actually read this one. It's incredible. Please pick up Chasing Shadows. Fred, Ted, we will see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jake.